So Mark chapter 6, verses 30 through 32 says, and the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said unto them, come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. And they departed into a desert place by ship privately. Now, this life that we live, you know, it's very, uh, we live in a society where busyness and uh, are uh, we're always on the move. There's always some task to complete. There's always some goal to achieve. There's always some deadline to meet. As soon as we finish one assignment, it's on to the next one. Whether we're talking about home, at work, at school or even the duties that we perform uh, for the church. Sometimes it's difficult to find time to take a break and rest. But Jesus understood the need for rest. In the scripture reading that we just uh, heard, he says to his disciples, come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going and they had no leisure so much as to eat. When we look at the context of, of what is going on here, this is in the aftermath of Jesus sending out his 12 disciples to go and share the gospel. Mark chapter 6, verses 7 through 13 says, And he called unto him the 12 and began to send them forth by two and two, and gave them power over unclean spirits, and commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey, save a staff only, no scrip, no bread, no money in their purse, but be shod with sandals, and not put on two coats. And he said unto them, In what place soever ye enter into a house, there abide, to, there abide till ye depart from that place. And whosoever shall not receive you nor hear you, when ye depart thence, shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. And they went out and preached that men should repent. And they cast out many devils and anointed with oil them that were sick and healed them. So here in the aftermath of these 12 apostles of Jesus doing the work of the gospel, the busyness of it. And then when you look at verses 14 through 29, that's sandwiched in between this uh, passage where Jesus sends his disciples out. And then where Jesus tells them to come and let's rest for a while. There's the story of the death of John the Baptist. So you can see it, sense that there's a lot going on in the minds and hearts of, of Jesus and his 12, 12 disciples. They're trying to do the work of the gospel, and now they get this bad news that John the Baptist, uh, who has been a, a great uh, pillar in the, the work for, for God and preparing the way for the Messiah to come, now he has been taken off the scene uh, by Herod. And so I, can, I just imagine that they were probably feeling a little bit overwhelmed. Right here they are. They're trying to work the mission, and here's this person who has been doing this mission, who has been killed. And so Jesus, recognizing that, you know, that sometimes even when we're doing the work of the gospel, that it is good to come aside and rest a while. And so he takes his disciples away. Now, if you continue reading in Mark chapter six, you realize that their little vacation was cut short because the people they figured out what was going on and they followed Jesus and. We have this uh, big miracle that takes place where Jesus feeds the 5,000, right? But Jesus understood the importance of rest. And this importance of rest is not a, a new concept when Jesus comes on the scene. You know, the, the work of uh, this idea of rest was instituted at creation, right? You heard a verse that uh, Liberty read saying that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, right? So we go through that creation story, and at the end of the creation story, in Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, it says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. And the seventh day, and on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work 
which he had created and made. Now this is before sin even existed, but God, when he created the heavens and the earth, when he created this planet, when he created all this beauty that we are enjoying right now, before he put, uh, or that he made, for, so when he put Adam and Eve on this earth, that they would have this beautiful environment to enjoy. Before his create, well, after his creative work was done, before the first week was over, he instituted this idea of rest. You see, God loves us so much that he does everything in his power so that he can take care of us, so that we can have the most abundant life that we can have, right? He takes care of us. As Layla told us, he said, she said that the Lord is our shepherd, right? He takes care of everything that we need. Why? Because he loves us, right? Even to the point where, even when sin came into the picture, he sent his son to die. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's what Erica told us. But God's example that he set for us is to work six days and to rest on the seventh. That is the divine formula that God instituted at creation and that he asks us to follow. The fourth commandment, Exodus chapter 20, verse 11 says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and hallowed it. So God gave us the Sabbath, so that we could come and rest a while. He understood that as time would go on, and especially in his foreknowledge seeing what would happen to this planet as sin came into this world, and how busy we would be trying to do what we needed to do to make ends meet, to take care of our families, to take care of ourselves, he realized that we needed a day of rest. Now there's a dual application to this though. You see, there's the, this idea that Sabbath is, allows us to rest after performing the labor that we have performed for six days. But if you think about Adam and Eve's uh, predicament, right? When they were first created, they were created on day number six. So their first full day of existence was what? It was the seventh day. So they got to enjoy a Sabbath rest in preparation to work six before they would rest again on the seventh day. And I can imagine that first seventh day that first sabbath as god is communing with adam and eve and he's giving them the grand tour of the garden of eden and explaining how things work and you know just giving them some lessons in nature preparing them to be able to do do the task that they would complete throughout that first six days of their own labor before they would come again to rest so this dual application of the sabbath and this rest that god has provided for us is to rest from the labors that we have committed and that we have undertaken for six days, but also to rejuvenate us spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally, so that we can be prepared to go out and work another six days. But after that, we know the story that sin came into the picture. And sin is symbolized by bondage or slavery. Romans chapter 6, verses 16 through 18 tells us, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves, servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Now, in here, in this King James translation, the word is translated as servants. It's the Greek word doulos, which actually has the connotation of being a slave. And, you know, when we, when we think about the, the children of Israel and how they were in bondage, right? They were in bondage in Egypt, and God set them free and delivered them from that bondage. And that's the same thing that God wants to do for us as we are caught up in the bondage of sin. We have mountain lions chasing us, right? 
that mountain lion, that, that lion, that adversary, that the devil who's roaring, seeking whom he may devour. But God has promised and he will deliver us from our enemies. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 12 through 15. This is the second version of the fourth commandment, which says, Keep the Sabbath day to sanctify it, as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant nor thy maidservant, nor thine ox, nor thine ass, nor, thine, or, nor any of thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates, that thy manservant and thy maidservant may rest as well as thou. And remember that thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. That mighty hand, that hand that is bigger than our hand, was the one who set the captives free. And so the Sabbath, it not only commemorates creation, but it also commemorates the fact that God delivers us from sin. Such amazing grace that we get to experience because of what God has done for us. Exodus chapter 31, verse 13 tells us, says, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. So the Sabbath is a sign of creation and redemption. It's a sign of the process of sanctification that God wants to work in our lives, which is to restore us and to recreate the image of God in us. You know, as I was thinking about this and I was thinking about how we are out here in, wild, in the wilderness, in nature, in the church of the wildwood, I was thinking about the Feast of Tabernacles. You know, it's the seventh of the uh, seven feasts in the Israelite um, list of feasts. And Deuteronomy chapter 16, verses 12 through 15 talks about it and says, And thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in Egypt, and thou shalt observe and do these statutes. Thou shalt observe the Feast of Tabernacles seven days. After that, thou hast gathered in thy corn and thy wine. And thou, ha thou shalt rejoice in thy feast, thou and thy son and thy daughter and thy manservant and thy maidservant and the Levite, the stranger and the fatherless and the widow that are within thy gates. Seven days shalt thou keep a solemn feast unto the Lord thy God in a place which the Lord shall choose because the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all thine increase and in all the works of thine hands. Therefore thou shalt surely rejoice. See, the Feast of Tabernacles was a time to rejoice they actually were to come away from their homes and from their permanent dwelling places and they were to go out and they were to make temporary shelters. Sort of like what we got here, right? Mm -hmm. We're out here in the wilderness at our own uh, sort of a feast of tabernacles that we are getting to experience out here <laughs> in nature. But that it was designed to remind them of how God had brought them or where he had brought them from in their past experience. But when we look at the seven feasts, uh, in the Jewish system, the seventh feast, the Feast of Tabernacles, is also a vision of the future. You see, because the, the Feast of Tabernacles will be, uh, it'll, it'll have its fulfillment when, we, when Jesus comes again and we are able to tabernacle with God throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. But the wilderness in the Bible, it is a place of refuge. I think of some of the Bible characters that spent some time in the wilderness. I think of Moses, who after he had committed a murder and the Egyptians were looking to, Pharaoh was looking to kill him, he was able to find refuge in the wilderness. And then there were the Israelites, of course. I just mentioned them, how they were delivered from the bondage of Egypt and they were led into the wilderness. That was God's place of refuge where he wanted to tabernacle with them. And then Elijah is on the run from Jezebel, uh, who wants to kill him, as she has done with some of the other prophets of God, and he's able to find refuge in the wilderness. And then I think of David, 
on the run from King Saul, who's looking to kill him. He was able to find refuge in the wilderness. How many times did Jesus take refuge in the wilderness as he's dealing with the Pharisees and the religious leaders of, the, of his day who just wanted to do nothing more than to get rid of him and to get him off the scene to, and how they plotted to kill him many a times before they actually were successful in doing so. But then also think about the church. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 6, it says, And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had the place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. So the church in the midst of the dark ages and the persecutions that were going on from the papal system, the Bible tells us that God had prepared a place of refuge for them in the wilderness. So the wilderness is a place of refuge. And, and I can feel that that's what we are experiencing here in this place. But the wilderness is also a place of preparation. Moses spent 40 years in the wilderness in preparation to be able to lead the children of Israel through that journey of 40 years in the wilderness before they would enter into the promised land. And the Israelites, of course, that was their testing ground. You know, the, as they wandered through the wilderness for 40 years, unfortunately only two of the souls that actually came out of Egypt were able to enter into the promised land. But it was a place where they were tested and prepared for that, uh, that mission, to enter into the true rest when they would go into the land of Canaan. Elijah, you know, he had that, that wonderful experience with God where he was sitting in the cave and you know, wondering, and, and he was actually in a place where he was ready to die. But God spoke to him right, and, and prepared him for a mission that he had uh, in store for him to do later on. And not to mention where when Elijah first came on the scene and he gives this, this prophetic message where there's not going to be any rain for three and a half years, you know, then he's led into the wilderness where God took care of him to prepare him to, for that big showdown on Mount Carmel. And then, of course, David, as he spent time in the wilderness, and uh, we, we see in some of the Psalms how he talks about how God was his refuge in the, in the wilderness and during those experiences. But it's those experiences, and especially as a shepherd in his younger days, that prepared him to be king over Israel. And we can't forget Jesus, who spent 40 days fasting in the wilderness in preparation for the three and a half year ministry that he would undertake as our savior. And of course the church in, in the time of the wilderness where they were able to um, get in, into a place of, of where they would fully trust God and the, the messages of, of the truth of the Bible were became uh, during the Great Awakening period where um, prophecies began to be known and understood, prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, but it was a time of preparation in preparation for the judgment time that was coming, which we now currently live in. But this wilderness time, we see it is, is a, it's a place, it's a time period between deliverance and eternal rest. It's the period between justification and glorification. The wilderness experience that we go through is the process of sanctification, where our characters are refined, where our minds are renewed, where the image of God is recreated in us. And it prepares us so that we will be able to stand one day when we behold Jesus coming in the clouds of glory. We won't be the ones, run, the ones running to the rocks crying for them to fall on us, but we will say, this is our God, we have waited for him, and he will save us. And we'll be prepared to go with him. Hebrews chapter four, verses one through 11, as I'm bringing this to a close. It says, let us therefore fear, lest they promise being left up of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spoke in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, 
if they shall enter into my rest. Seeing therefore it, remain, it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again he limited a certain day, saying to David, Today, after so long a time, and it is said, Today, if ye will hear his voice, pardon not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. By faith we can enter into the rest that God has entered into at the beginning of creation. It's his desire that we should enter into that rest. But we can't enter into that rest based upon our own work. It has to come by faith in what God has done for us to make provision for us. So we have the opportunity to enter into that rest now. We don't have to wait till Jesus comes again to enter into that rest. We can enter into that rest here and now today. Jesus in Matthew chapter 11 verses 28 through 30 says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am weak and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Life can be rough. There's a lot of things that we go through. There's a lot of things that we have to deal with. But Jesus says that we can have rest from our labors. When we feel burdened, when we feel heavy laden, when life is beating us down and we don't have anywhere we can turn, we can always turn to Jesus. And he has promised that if we do so, that he will give us rest. All right? Amen.